Welcome to Opto Sessions. This week on the show, we have Kevin Carter, founder and chief investment officer of EMQQ Global, a San Francisco-based investment management and research firm focused on the emerging and frontier markets technology sector. Hey, Kevin. How's it going? You okay? Good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, very good. Very good. Um, starting to get into winter here, so darker days, but uh, a lot of people in the office getting stuff done, so it's, it's okay. Uh, how, how, where are you calling from today? I'm in uh, San Francisco, actually 15 miles east of San Francisco. Okay, brilliant. How's it, how's it going in San Francisco? Um, it's probably not as dark and uh, winter-like <laughs> as it is there, but it's definitely feeling like it's uh, coming fast. And um, I thought we could just kick off by, uh, I wanted to ask you, you describe yourself as an active value investor. So I thought you could just elaborate to us. Sure. Well, I, I, I like to note that because I've, you know, worked in and around the indexing space and I have for the last 25 years. But, you know, when it, when it comes to investing, um, you know, there's a lot of ways to sort of parse things and divide them up. But, but one of the biggest, you know, divisions is, are you an active investor or a passive slash index investor? And, uh, you know, when I think of, you know, the, the pinnacle of active investing, it's Berkshire Hathaway and the, you know, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger approach to things. And, and, and it's also that approach to business. I mean, you know, ultimately investing in stocks is buying businesses. And so, you know, whether it's an investment decision or a business decision, I try to think through, you know, that type of a lens, a Berkshire Hathaway lens, but, yeah. Um, but I've worked with this guy, uh, uh, Dr. Burton Malkiel from Princeton for the last, you know, 20 something years. And he's one of the founding fathers of indexing. And, and also it should be noted that, you know, one of the uh, biggest proponents of indexing is in fact, Warren Buffett. And uh, it was the 1995 Berkshire Hathaway annual report that I read when I was, you know, young and had only been in the industry for a few years. And when, when, Warren Buffett suggested in his letter that most investors should buy index funds, both individual and institutional. That really caught my attention and it led me to sort of dig into the mathematics of everything and, and realize that, in fact, he was right and that uh, <laughs> that most investors should, uh, you know, employ an index like uh, strategy and, and try to minimize the cost of turnover and you know high management fees, et cetera. So. So I, I, you know, I, I try to blend both, really, and um, and I think that helps me. One of the things I've realized about indexing, especially in emerging markets, is there's a there's a lot of holes in the system, and the the indexes, the broad index that most people reference, the MSCI Emerging Markets Index, um, it has a lot of problems. It's missing a lot yeah. of companies. It's missing most of the internet companies in emerging markets, which you know is what we're focused on. And it also has a lot of the so-called state-owned enterprises. These are government-controlled banks and oil companies yeah. that, while they are public, they're not really, um, you know, they're, they're, their number one goal is not to grow their earnings like, yeah. like a, okay. you know, a normal company. And, you know, as an investor, when you buy a business, the way its value goes up is when they grow the earnings. And yeah. if the people that run the state-owned enterprises don't care about that. It doesn't really make sense to probably invest in them at all. And and the broad index is the MSCI is about a 30% in state-owned enterprises. And, and most of the internet companies, you know, the Mercado Libre, which is the e-commerce leader of Latin America is not in the index. Yeah. And the Southeast Asian internet companies are not in the index. And, and so there's a, I think a big problem and it's, you know, the process of, of indexing and index funds. You have one group that makes a list that, you know, comprises the index and it's not clear how rigorous the effort is, you know, on that side of the equation to make sure companies that, that should be included get included because what's happened with globalization is, and I'll use Mercado Libre, the, the you know, uh, Latin American e-commerce leader as an example. The company, first of all, its headquarters were in Argentina for a long time, which is not even a frontier market. It's been demoted to a standalone market um, and it trades on the NASDAQ. So the, the way that the indexing works is it works off of a database and every country, every company gets put into a box and, and 
when it comes to country code, you can only be in one country. Now, Mercado Libre generates revenue in, in dozens of com- countries. And yeah. Brazil is the largest market in Latin America, and it's, it's Mercado Libre's largest market. Mexico is the second largest market in Latin America, and it's also Mercado Libre's second largest market. But the database actually now says it's in Uruguay because they moved their headquarters across the river from Buenos Aires to Montevideo, as have a lot of technology companies. And so now, you know, all of this Internet revenue, at least in the database, it says it's coming from Uruguay. And so this this is the reason why it's not in the MSCI index. You know, I, I, it's not my job to figure out why the MSCI index has so many problems, but um, I suspect it has to do with the country code, which again, yeah. that's where the that's where the mailbox is, but that's not where the customers are. And what you you know, when yeah. you're investing in emerging market consumption or emerging market consumer technology, you don't care about where the company is. You care about where the revenue is coming from. Where's the business? And a lot of times. In fact, m- most of the times in, in emerging markets, or at least you know about half the times, they don't match. So Mercado Libre says Uruguay, but it's Brazil and Mexico and 20 other countries. Um, and it trades on the NASDAQ. That's another problem. Sometimes it's the place that these companies actually trade. What, what country does the stock trade in? And some databases will say, well, that's a US company because yeah, it trades yeah. on the NASDAQ. And so this is a problem frankly, that I realized 18 years ago when I got you know, pulled into China, when I had some investors that wanted to invest in China and I tried to figure out how to do that. And I figured we would just use the China ETF. Uh, there was a, one China ETF on the planet 18 years ago when I got involved. And I, you know, when we decided we ought to use the ETF, I asked for a list of all the companies that were in the China ETF. It has the ticker FXI, it still trades. And uh, it's an iShares fund. And I, I asked for the list of the companies in the index because I, you know, I'm, I'm an Omaha person. So you can tell me it's the China ETF, but I want to see what are the businesses we're going to become owners of. And, yep. you know, the first thing I learned was that most of the index, especially the single country China index, was about 80 percent state owned enterprises. <laughs> and it had very little, in, you know, in terms of consumption exposure. And, and most glaringly, it didn't include Baidu the Google of China, which was already public 18 years ago. It actually went public the year before Google did, and it wasn't in the China index and it wasn't in the China ETF. And I, you know, we called the people at iShares and asked why they didn't own the Google of China. And they said that they didn't consider it a Chinese company because it traded in the United States. And I thought that was crazy. It was, you know, the most entrepreneurial. I mean, being the Google of anything sounded like a good idea. And being the Google of the biggest country on the planet seemed like a very good idea. But the index providers said, no, it's it trades in the United States, so we don't count it. And that problem persisted. Well, it persists till today. The Chinese companies, many of them finally got added to the MSCI index after the Alibaba IPO. And it was the Alibaba IPO because it got so much coverage that finally opened up people's eyes to the fact that it, you know, if you own the Vanguard Emerging Markets Fund, you weren't going to own Alibaba. <laughs> and it still took three years for the index providers to fix that problem and add Alibaba. But Mercado Libre, as I mentioned, in Latin America, which, you know, arguably is the best company in all of Latin America if you want to participate in the growth not just of e-commerce, but of, you know, financial services online. Yeah, yeah. And then the other glaring example is in Southeast Asia. You've got uh, companies like C Limited and GoTo and, and Grab, and their businesses are all over Southeast Asia. They're in Indonesia, they're in Vietnam, they're in Malaysia, they're in the Philippines, but their headquarters are in Singapore. And now Singapore is a developed country with, you know, 5 million wealthy people. And so the database says, well, these are companies in Singapore. That's a developed market. Well, yes, their headquarters are there, but the business itself, the revenue, the customers are all over Southeast Asia, but they're not included yeah. in the index. And that's, uh, it, again, it, it, could, it could be a, either or both of the reasons, which are where's the address for the mail and where's the stock trade? Because those companies also 
like C Limited trade here in the United States. And yeah. and that's another, you know, the reason that they trade here is another important part of the story because, you know, corporate governance is your biggest problem in emerging markets. But but the, what's happening with the internet companies in emerging markets is they all have a very similar, um, you know, origin story. That, and it, it goes like this. And I, I, I mean this, you know, very, very simplistically and generally, but it's actually quite true. Um, and it is that basically the, you know, the smartest kid from every country goes to Harvard or Stanford. Now, I went to the University of Arizona. University of Arizona is a fantastic school, but um, but nonetheless, most of the, the smartest kids in the world go to Harvard or Stanford. And after they graduate, they go to work for Google or Microsoft or Amazon. And then they go back to Harvard or Stanford for their MBAs. And then they go and start an internet company. And, they're, and when they do that, they're getting funded by U.S. institutions like the Harvard Endowment or the Stanford Endowment. Uh, at least their, you know, their their money th through a venture fund, and so, um, and in the case of Mercado Libre, the founder wrote the business plan at the, you know, at the Stanford Library in 1999, and the uh, guest speaker at the graduation was a venture capitalist, and the founder uh, of Mercado Libre got a chance to pitch him on his plan to move back to South America and start the Amazon.com of South America. And this venture investor said, great, I'll invest. That sounds like a great idea. <laughs> and so you have this, uh, the capital formation process these companies go through includes the greatest you know, venture investors in the world usually. And so when they go public, they want to go public on the best exchanges, which are the NYSE and the NASDAQ. So again, Mercado Libre, Stanford, you know, NASDAQ, yeah, yeah. C Limited. If you look at the founders of C Limited, they've got uh, founders that went to Carnegie Mellon, they went to the University of Chicago, they went to Harvard. So, again, smartest kids from every country coming to our best schools. Not always, but but usually. And in in the case of India, which I think we're going to talk about, India also has twenty three of its own uh, fantastic technology schools, the Indian wow. Institutes of Technology. So. So that's that's what you know the, these companies look like, and that's I think another part of the reason why the index itself is missing uh, the majority of these companies and the ones that I think investors really should want to own if they're going to invest in the growth of emerging markets. That's a problem that still exists in this day and age. That they've you know they constructed some of these indexes so simplistically that they you know really overlook some of the most exciting companies that should be in there. Well, there's. You, a lot of questions uh, are raised when you start looking under the hood of the yeah. so-called emerging and frontier markets. Um, lo a lot of questions. The title, yeah. th there's a lot of moving parts behind the scenes that I think people would be surprised at the the lack of precision in, uh, 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 in the system. Yeah. And um, I thought we, you could just give us a quick... Uh, intro to your your background, which is you, you're obviously an entrepreneur yourself, been very successful, and it was interesting to read about it myself. So I'm sure other people just uh, be interested to see you know the companies that you've been involved with. In oh the, well, um, so I guess if I was going to give you the fast version, you know, I started in January 90, 1992, and you know I wasn't a great student at college, but as soon as it it really mattered, I became a really good student. And uh, started reading and trying to understand everything I could about investing. And and it started with reading A Random Walk Down Wall Street, which is the book that sort of laid the foundation for indexing uh, index funds and ETFs. When it was first written 50 years ago, there were no index funds. But the author, uh, Bert Malkiel, who's been my partner now for 25 years, he suggested in, in 1972 that somebody should make an index fund. And a couple of years later, his friend John Vogel started Vanguard and so so that's how I started by, you know, reading about that. But then I quickly, as mentioned, became a, you know, an Omaha person. And I spent every you know minute I could find free to read the works of Peter Lynch and, and Warren Buffett's letters and everything written about, you know, Buffett and Munger and so forth. So so that's how I started. I worked as an analyst and, you know, was a sort of young, cocky value investor. And this dot com bubble thing showed up and I was shorting amazon.com in 1998 and losing a lot of money very quickly 
And then I ended up meeting Bert Malkiel, which I'll, I'll leave that story out, but I ended up meeting uh, Bert Malkiel, the, the guy that uh, I mentioned earlier, who, by the way, also oversaw the creation of the first ETF. He was the chairman of the new products committee at the Amex that created the spider. So anyway, I met him and, and I had this idea that I thought was important. You know, back then, if you wanted to invest in the stock market, you had two choices. You could buy a mutual fund that probably had a lot of fees, and that's what most people ended up doing, um, or you could buy stocks directly. But there was a pretty big barrier to that because if you wanted to buy a stock, um, the cheapest commission was $29 for a trade, and that was from Schwab, and you had to buy 100 shares to get the $29 commission. And the average stock price was $30 a share approximately. So if somebody wanted to invest directly into the stock market, it would take $3,000 to get the you know 1% commission. And, and most people didn't have that much money. If you were trying to save up you know, every month and you were you know, 26 or seven like I was, well, you were sort of stuck going into a, a product like a mutual fund that could accept $500 a month or yeah. $200 a week or whatever it was. Because you know that's ultimately the most important part when you're an investor. You need to start investing on a regular basis. And, and so I realized or basically figured out that you needed to let people buy stocks you know, $10 at a time. So you could buy $10 worth of Coca-Cola. And, and there were some stocks like Berkshire Hathaway that you know the share price was, I don't know, $80,000 a share. So you had no chance to invest unless you could use fractional shares. So I developed a system that would allow people to buy stocks in dollar amounts instead of share amounts. We called it, you know, the company was e-investing, the Electronic Investing Corporation. And uh, uh, so I was a dot-com entrepreneur starting in 1999 and built e-investing and we sold it to E-Trade in the year 2000. Now, that functionality has gone mainstream. When I measure how early I was, I, yeah. I, I measure against Charles Schwab, the company, and now Charles Schwab and every other brokerage firm offers that fractional share trading, which is good for investors. And then, uh, and Bert Malkiel, the Princeton economist and Vanguard board member was an advisor to that company. After that, Bert and I had this other idea that we started kicking around, which was to let people build their own custom index portfolios. And we started a company called Active Index Advisors in 2002. The idea being that you didn't have to buy all 500 stocks. You could buy 50 or 100 stocks that were from the S&P and that you could do that in your own account. So you owned the stocks directly. So you controlled your tax basis. Um, and if you didn't want to invest in certain sectors like alcohol or tobacco, you could leave those uh, things out. Now, this is also something you can buy at Schwab now. They've, uh, the industry has evolved and they've renamed it direct indexing. Yeah. So we did that and sold that to Natixis in uh, the very end of 2004. And... Um, uh, they still operated. It's got a twenty, almost a twenty-five year track record. It's beat the. It's beaten the. By the way, the real trick with that strategy is you can beat the index if you're a taxable investor, just by doing loss harvesting. If the auto sector goes down, you sell your General Motors shares for a loss and you buy Ford. So that was the theory: was we could, you know, give you the same return as the index pre-tax in active indexing, but then through loss harvesting, you could actually beat the index after tax and that's real return. Um, yeah. And so that's worked really well. And then um, then I thought at that point, I would was gonna go back and uh, you know do my Warren Buffett uh, thing, but Burton uh, got very interested in China and convinced me we ought to focus on China. So 18 years ago, I got pulled into the China uh, um, you know, the China market somewhat reluctantly. But once when Google went public, they asked Burton, my partner, to give a talk to their employees about investing. And I wasn't involved. But a few months later, a person from Google called me and told me that they wanted to invest in this active active S&P 500. And I tried to direct him towards a financial advisor because we didn't work with individuals. But he had a pretty good amount of money and convinced me that I should be his advisor. And so I had uh, 
all of a sudden in 2005, I started going to Mountain View every week to, you know, because he started introducing me to other people at Google. And um, so in 2005, I was going back and forth to Mountain View, but Burton, my partner, had started to go to China. Two of his Princeton economist colleagues were Chinese and they had been offered, uh, you know, good salaries to return and teach economics in Beijing. And they had done that and they started to, you know, bother Burton and say, hey, Bert, you have to come see this economic miracle that's happening in China. And this is back when China's economy was growing at, you know, 11 or 12 percent. And so he wrote a white paper with these two guys about investing in China. And the Google people called me and asked if Burton could come talk about investing in China. And I said, sure. And then, you know, it was almost 18 years ago. We drove down to Mountain View one day and Burton gave his talk. And then everyone looked at me and said, we want to invest in China. And I, it was not planned. But from the moment that talk ended until today, somehow my whole life has been devoted to figuring out what on earth does that mean to invest in China? And then that broadened out to all of the other emerging markets. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe a decade ago, we we broadened it out. But that's how it, that's how I got here. And uh, in the first eight years, focused on emerging markets in China, uh, Burton and I launched a number of Chinese ETFs with Guggenheim that Invesco has since acquired, including most notably CQQQ, which was a China tech ETF we launched uh, maybe 12 or 13 years ago, many years before K-Web uh, showed up. Um, yeah. And uh, but applause, uh, applause to K-Web. They did a, a better job marketing uh, and uh, have had quite a success with that. But um, but but when I wasn't with the Guggenheim people talking about these China ETFs, I spent most of my time in Boston and New York with a bunch of family offices and foundations and endowments and and I watched how they were sort of evolving their approach to emerging markets. They were increasing their their weights. I think during that period, Harvard's went from 6% to 12% of their endowment. But as they got bigger, they would start to get more targeted. And um, we call this emerging markets 3.0. So rather than buy the index, they would do things a little bit more creative and if you were, for example, David Swenson running the Yale Endowment, well, you had a lot of options that most people didn't have. Yeah. Uh, what one of the things Yale did was they took their what you know what David thought was one of their smartest alumni and had him you know go back to Shanghai and set up a private equity fund called Hill House, which has worked very well. But most people couldn't start a private equity fund, and so when people would ask me, you know, what's the best emerging markets ETF? I would always tell them to buy the emerging market consumer ETF because I I didn't make that ETF. But when you really take apart the entire emerging market story, and it doesn't matter if it's China or India or Brazil or Nigeria, the thing that's emerging are the people. And there's, you know, six and a half billion of them and they want stuff. They want all of the things we take for granted. They want more and better food, more and better clothing. They want appliances. They want to go to movies. Yeah. They want to take vacations. They want a motorized vehicle and they want their kids to go to Harvard. And I didn't have to figure that out, by the way. It was well documented, you know, for decades before I got involved. And, you know, McKinsey calls that the biggest growth opportunity in the history of capitalism. So so that's what I became focused on. And what I when people would ask me, I would tell them just buy the emerging market consumer ETF. I, now, I didn't make that ETF. But I knew that it existed and it owned the 30 largest emerging market consumer stocks, according to the database. So, you know, food, clothing, uh, those types of things. And it was about nine years ago that I had a friend call me and ask me that very question. What's the best emerging markets ETF for long term investing? And. I started to tell that person to buy the emerging market consumer ETF, but that's when I had a light bulb moment, if you will, for EMQQ. And the reason that I think I had that light bulb was that earlier in that day, I had been looking at my own personal uh, portfolio and I had, uh, uh, I had five stocks in my account and all of them were part of this emerging market consumer story. 
but only two of them were included in the emerging market consumer uh, ETF. Those were, uh, or three of them rather, um, food and clothing companies in Hong Kong, um, Want Want, which is like the Nabisco of China, you know, crackers and snack foods. Um, then I had these two Chinese sportswear companies, Li Ning and Peak Sports, which are like Reebok and Converse, you know, branded uh, uh, basketball shoes and so forth. So those were the first three companies I had personally invested in food and clothing. But I had these two other stocks that I owned that I, you know, were clearly part of the emerging market consumer story. But the database said they were technology companies. The first one uh, was Mercado Libre, which I mentioned earlier, the Amazon.com of Brazil. And the other one was Wuba, which was like the Craigslist of China, uh, local ads and an incredibly profitable business. And, and, and after I had looked at my portfolio, I thought, well, all five of these are consumer stocks. The ones that are called consumer stocks in the database they're, they're great businesses. They were growing at 15 or 20%. I thought they had moats with their brand, but the two internet companies were growing at 120%. And even though the database said they were technology companies, I mean, they were clearly, you know, being, uh, their revenue was coming from consumers. And so that's really what, what sparked the idea. But, it, you know, to be frank, it, it really wasn't that hard to see. I mean, if you even you know nine years ago, you could already see that the you know the Fang stocks had taken over our lives and our stock market. And every time there was an earnings season, you know, if you turned on CNBC, you saw the Fang stocks were you know crushing it, and there was a list of traditional you know retailers that were going to go bankrupt, right? Yeah. Whether it was Sears or J.C. Penney's or what have you. And so you know the the writing was sort of on the wall, if you will, and and it wasn't really as clear to me then as it is now, but what what makes this story so much more powerful in emerging markets is that um, we've had in the developed world a very gradual experience with information and with technology, right? I mean, I first had access to a computer when I got to college and my roommate had an Apple computer that we wrote papers on, which is basically all we did was write papers on it. I think by the time I was a senior, we were able to play Risk on the computer as well. <laughs> um, but other than that, that's, you know, but, but I did have a computer. And I got the internet in 1995, right, for the first time in San Francisco uh, on a telephone line with a modem attached. So, you know, we've had the internet, we've had computers for decades. Well, what's happening now is that there's these six and a half billion people they want all the things we take for granted. So essentially, there's three different mega trends happening on the planet right now. And they're driving this incredible growth story. The first is the rise of the emerging market consumer. I mean, that is the foundation of what we do here at EMQQ. The second mega trend is called the computer. When I, when I first got a smartphone, you know, 10 years ago, you know, I could see how it was changing my life. But I had a computer for 20 years before I got a smartphone. Well, Guess what? Most of the world is getting their first computer today, and it's not a desktop computer, and it doesn't have an Apple logo. The Android-based smartphone that's getting better every year and more affordable every year is bringing the computer to the world for the first time. And it's happening right now at an incredible rate. About 7 million people a month in India alone getting their first ever computer. And... They're getting more affordable. If we had this talk five months ago, I would have told you that you could buy a brand new smartphone in India for $50. And that's true. But as of July 3rd, you can also buy one for $12. So now, you know, the 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 super pocket size supercomputer costs, you know, as much as a, a couple of cheeseburgers. So the the computer is coming to the world for the first time. And and what it's bringing with it is something that I get, again, I've had for 30 years called the Internet. And so, you know, while we've been wired here first, telephone lines, then the cable, and then we got Wi-Fi and, and you know, finally mobile. Well, most of the world never had all those other steps. So when they get that first smartphone, they're also getting their first Internet access. Yeah. And, and, and because they don't have, first of all, they, most importantly, they don't have a bank account and they don't have a credit card right? They're, they're operating with paper currency. Um, 
they don't have a, a automobile and there's no target store to drive to, even if they had one. These people are leapfrogging and are even more digital than we are. And that really can be seen um, in in the financial services space the most. I mean, you need to get payments on the phone to have e-commerce and that's happening at an incredible rate, especially today in India. Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. It'd be great, I think, to, to discuss India in a bit more detail because I know it's an area that you've got a lot of knowledge about. Um, so I thought we could start with just what, the, what is the uh, growth narrative there? So you touched on a few things, which are uh, access to the internet, which is being driven by uh, these small computers that mobile phones in their pocket. What other things? are making India such an interesting growth story? Well, India is um, is an incredibly interesting and, and powerful story today. And it's a combination of things and, and timing in terms of when this is happening, in, you know, on the calendar, um, in the arc of, com, you know, consumer technology development. It, it, India is could be the perfect emerging market. And, and when I say that, I mean the, the following thing. So if we talk about like, you know, the at a very simple level, like what's the prototype for an emerging market? Why do we want to invest in emerging markets? And, and if we were going to design the best one, what does it look like? Well, first of all, it's big. It has a lot of people. India has more people than anybody. India passed China in April. And it's now the largest population on the planet with 1.4 billion people plus. You'd have to take the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth countries and add them all together to equal the population yeah. of India. So the scale of it is unmatched by anything except for China. But its demographics are better than China. So it not only is it bigger now, it's going to get bigger and bigger because China's average age is in the 30s and India's average age is in the, the, the low 20s. So you've got an 11-year um, age gap. And so the Indian population is heading into its prime years. It's got over 600 million Gen Z, uh, which is more than China and the U.S. combined. So it's big and it's young. Um, it's got the fastest growing major economy growing. Uh, well, last quarter they grew over 7%, but the estimates are for about 6 um, though I suspect those those estimates might be low. So big, young, fast growing. Most of that growth is coming in consumption, just as we saw in China over the last 20 years. Smartphone penetration is still only about 50%. So it's got, you know, a, that will accelerate with the $12 uh, smartphone. And it's got the fastest growing e-commerce market, just a little bit ahead of Brazil. And finally, um, it's got a, a government that is... Uh, supportive of technology, which is a part of the story that I didn't appreciate as much as I do now. Um, you know, even a year ago, I, I didn't quite appreciate the digital platform that the um, Indian uh, government has helped put in place. So so the prototype, you know, things about emerging markets, India checks all the boxes, big, young, fast growing, consumption growth. and And so you have that. But then you have a few other things that um, that that no other emerging or developed market has ever had at, at this juncture. So um, India has, well, first of all, the one thing that they've done in the last decade, which is really important, is you know when I got involved with China eighteen years ago. India was, and China were really close together. I mean, their GDPs per capita were very similar. Their total GDPs were very similar. But but what you could see was that China was building the world's greatest infrastructure. And, you know, with a, uh, a you know, a one-party system, you know, it, there's not a lot of bureaucracy. So when they say we're going to do this, they do it, and they do it at scale, and they do it fast. And so you can see China just kept pulling ahead of India, and India was sitting on its hands. And it wasn't investing in the infrastructure. And, you know, the power grid didn't even work well. You had brownout, power outages that went on for days sometimes. So, so now in the last decade, that's changed. And Modi, who 
is the prime minister and by most accounts is doing a fantastic job. He's got the place running like a business now. And the infrastructure investment in the last decade since he took office is, you know, staggering, frankly. I mean, they've built more roads and almost every metric that uh, uh, the investment in the last 10 years has has been more than the previous 65 years. So that's highways, that's trains, that's seaports, that's airports. So the infrastructure investments there. So that's, you know, an area where India needed to get its act together and they and they have it, you know, certainly on a relative basis. The other thing India has that that is unique is it has a technology sector that's older than me. So India has had a technology se- sector for over 50 years. You've got Infosys, Tata, uh, Ypro. These are the, they call it India Technology 1.0 leaders. They've got publicly traded tech companies that have been publicly traded for 30 years. They've got billionaire founders. They have an ecosystem of um, venture investors, technologists. Um, they have uh, uh, 23 institutes of technology that are modeled after MIT. So if they, the Indian student you know, can't get into Harvard or Stanford, then he's still got uh, choices in India, which in, in, in many ways are harder to get into than our Ivy League schools. Um, uh, uh, India has uh, historically taken about two thirds of the work visas for uh, the U.S. tech companies. About 300,000 HB1 visas a year are given out, but two thirds of those go to Indian technologists. Two of those temporary workers now run Google and Microsoft. There's another 20 Indians that run S&P 500 companies as well. So in terms of just a talent pool, of human capital, nothing like it, nothing like it on the planet. Um, And then the final thing that India has, which is the part that I alluded to earlier that I didn't really appreciate is they have built a a digital public infrastructure, um, which you can call, or they is often referred to as the India stack. And now, I've known about some of the programs that compose this so-called India stack, and I've known about them for a long time. Uh, well, let me tell you what these what these things are that they've built and also tell you how I sort of learned about them. But the first thing that India has built in this digital public infrastructure started in 2009, and it's called Adar, which means foundation. So the way to think about this stack is a series of programs that work together and serve as a, as a digital a platform for the whole country. Other general examples of digital public infrastructure, which, again, I know it sounds boring and sort of abstract, but the simplest way to think about it is GPS, right? If you use GPS, which your food delivery driver uses, which your Uber delivery driver uses, which your maps uses, that's digital public infrastructure that we have access to, as is the internet itself. So now India's got its own ver- you know, layers of public infrastructure, starting with Adahar, which again means foundation. So here's what happened. One of the problems India had in, in developing was that you know, 15 years ago, nobody had an identification card from the government. There was a very small percentage of the people could actually prove who they were with an official government document. And less than half of the babies were even reported to the government. So it was kind of a free for all. And the government, I think, you know, had known they they ought to fix this. And finally, in 2009, they launched an effort to develop a national identity card system so that everybody in the country would get a government issued card with their picture and a unique 12 digit number, kind of like a social security number. And when they launched it, they asked this man named Nandal Nilkani if he would oversee this effort. Now, Nandan was pretty well known then. He was one of the founders of Infosys and a tech billionaire and currently the chairman of Infosys. And they asked him if he would be in charge of this program. And he said that he would be in charge of the program, provided that they use technology a lot more than the government had in the past. 
he had done some work with the Bangalore city government and was a little shocked by the lack of technology behind the scenes. And he insisted that, that Autohar would not just use the best technology available at the time, but also be looking out into the future and what they thought might be available in the coming years. And he insisted that if he was going to be in charge, every 12 digit number be tied to a human being with fingerprint scan and an eyeball scan. And now this was a completely voluntary program and you did not have to sign up for it. And they launched it in 2010. So I knew about this program. We had it, the logo was on one of my slides and it said, look, the, the, the Indian government is you know, using technology, right? In a very generic way. So that, that's the Autohar system, which is a foundation, which again, I knew about it, but it was sort of, it was a government program. It just kind of made me, it was boring, frankly, to me. And so I didn't really pay that much attention to it. Well, then what happened a couple years later or three years later, they put another layer on the stack, which is a KYC know your customer layer. And they said, all right, if you're in the Autohar, if you've signed up and you're in the system, you can go into a bank with no identification, no paperwork involved, put your fingers down on a pad and look into a camera and instantly open a bank account. So that was the second layer of the stack. Now, again, I think I knew about it, but I didn't pay much attention. It was you know, 11 years ago. And frankly, we only had two Indian holdings and it was less than half a percent of our portfolio. And meanwhile, China was almost 60%. So so that that launched and I, I hadn't followed it, but but I was somewhat shocked to learn this spring that there's now one point three billion plus people in the system. So essentially the entire country now has registered voluntarily to be in a biometric database and they've opened eight hundred million digital bank accounts. So this. um this foundation has got a lot of value, um, including digitizing the entire population, financial inclusion in seven years from nobody has a bank account to everybody has a bank account. Then the, the next layer that is relevant is called the Unified Payments Interface, the UPI. And this program launched in 2016 and it got a lot of coverage and you know we added the logo uh, as another government initiated program, and you know it had its its logo and and whatever and and but the program the the, the high level um, description of it was that it was a, a system that would allow any two people in India to transfer money instantly to one another or person to a business with absolutely no cost friction or delay. So I send you ten dollars, it's instantly in your bank account. You send it back to me. We send it back a thousand times. It's still ten dollars. Wow! And that you know, I I understood that kind of at a high level. Um, and I added the logo, but frankly, the only thing I I thought about was Paytm because one of the companies I featured in my presentation was the Indian payments leader, Paytm, which hadn't gone private yet or hadn't hadn't gone IPO yet. But because we didn't have many public companies, we featured some of the unicorns. And I featured Paytm specifically because Berkshire Hathaway is one of its early investors. And so, so but I, th I saw, well, payments are going to be free. Well, then how will Paytm make any money? That was the only thing I thought when, yeah. when they launched the UPI. I guess I should tell one other little anecdote about this story that really shows the the economic or um, capitalist power of this platform. So the other thing that happened in 2016, which again was only seven years ago, was sort of the big bang moment for India and the India tech story. And that was the launch of Reliance Geo. So Reliance Industries, which is a 50-year-old conglomerate that's in all parts of the Indian economy, but has for the last decade decided it's going all in on digital India. It uh, launched the first 4G mobile network. So back in 2016, right when the smartphones were starting to you know, get sold uh, and fly off the shelves, 
in India, most of the phone users were on 2G. There was about 10 carriers, Airtel, Vodafone, and they were all in a deadly price war with on 2G. And none of them had any money to invest in 3G. And Reliance came in big and spent $25 billion to build a, from scratch brand new hardware infrastructure to cover the whole country, ready for 5G and 6G. Wow. And they bought the first and only 4G uh, license. And when they launched in November of 2016, their goal was to sign up 100 million people by the end of 2017. And that seemed um, uh, outrageous, but they had a pretty compelling offer. The offer that they said was, if you sign up with us, we'll give you unlimited voice calls forever for free. We'll give you unlimited data for six months, and then we'll have the lowest cost after that. Wow. And everybody else was on 2G. There wasn't much competition in terms of quality, and uh, the price was hard to beat as well. And now it, back then, it took three hours to get a new phone. If you went into the Airtel store or Vodafone store, it would take you a few hours to have them get comfortable that you were who you said and that you were <laughs> going to make your payments and so forth. And when when Geo launched, they put their in-store system on top of Autohar. So when you walked into the Geo store, you could get a new phone in five minutes just by putting your fingers down and looking in the camera. And they did sign up 100 million people, but it only took them four months, an average turn of about five minutes. So they took a three-hour business cycle and turned it into a five-minute business cycle. And that was the first real example of the power of this India stack, you know, from a commercial standpoint. Yeah. Now they have, you know, almost 500 million subscribers. They have the lowest cost data in the world. U.S. smartphone users pay 50 times as much for our data as the Indian smartphone user. Data is so expensive in the U.S. Apparently so. Uh, I mean, when I saw that, that we pay 50 times as much as India does, <laughs> I had a lot of questions, but but that's true. And, and they're using their, their phone. The Indian smartphone user con consumes more data than anybody. They watch a lot of video. Um, they use YouTube as Google, as one Wall Street Journal article claimed or said. <laughs> so... So, so now, if you look at what's happened, in, because the other thing that India did was they, they took a lot of the large denomination bills out of circulation. One of the, one of the problems that India had was it was all cash-based and nobody paid their taxes. And they, you know, it wasn't really clear how big the economy was or wasn't. And, um, and in the course of seven years, first of all, the UPI payments have exploded. The, the, the payments on the UPI went from essentially nothing seven years to go to now. I think they're getting close to 12 billion a month, which is half of the world's payments that are re real time instant payments. Um, and the slope of that curve is it looks like this and it's not flattening. It's it's um, uh, absolutely rocketing. And the economy now, the seven years ago. India's economy was over 95% paper-based currency. Today, it's 80% digital. And so that same, you know, the, the payments market is now mirrored in the digitization of the economy. People are paying their taxes. They've simplified the tax code. And that, that, those tax collections are feeding the infrastructure. So you have this virtuous cycle now from digitizing the economy and it's it's still pretty early that if you listen to Nanda Nilkani and there's a wonderful Morgan Stanley interview with this man it's about 10 minutes long but he talks about the beginning of this you know digital stack to where it is today and then where he sees it going in the near future and it's pretty exciting there's uh, a new layer on the stack called the ONDC which will help to digitize the 13 million mom and pop stores that are still 90% of Indian uh, retail spending. Um, there is a strong belief that the consumer credit opportunity in India is large and that this uh, digital stack will you know, provide sort of informational collateral that will bring millions of people into the uh, uh, you know, opportunity to, to use credit for their consumption, which 
has the opportunity of boosting economic growth by, you know, yep. one or two full points. So there's a lot that this stack has already shown in terms of its power. And, and I, I think it's still kind of early and no other country on the world has this. I mean, this is a very unique. It would, without, you know, going into details, it'd be probably pretty hard to get the American population to sign up for a, <laughs> a database where all of their information was tied to their eyeballs and, and fingerprints. But, but if you, you know, think about the accelerating element to an economy to having that whether it's airport airport lines or checking out of the store i mean having that ability to tie uh yourself to um you know digital identification that's instant is pretty powerful and i think it uh remains to be seen so i i really do think that that the india story it might be the perfect emerging market because not only does it have all those basic things I talked about, it, now it's also got this digital stack. And so we look at, you know, one of the things we've tried to look at is, okay, well, is India like China 15 years ago, right? We saw what happened in China. Its economy grew 400% in those 15 years, about 800% in the, you know, 18 or 19 years, a miracle of compounding. So India looks like it's ready to do the same thing. And the only difference is, or there's a few differences, but, but, the, the biggest difference is that when when China started this, you know, S curve of growth as the Alibaba's and Tencent's, you know, took off when it started, nobody on the planet had a smartphone and there was only 200 million PCs in China. Well, now India is going into the same thing and a, you can get a supercomputer for 12 bucks. <laughs> so this is why the India story is so compelling. Um, and, and of course, India has other things going for it, um, you know, in a geopolitical world where there's lots of tensions. A lot of those tensions revolve around China. India is in this unique um, place where it, you know, it, it, it can buy as much Russian oil as it wants and the prime minister can still have dinner at the White House. <laughs> so um, India's got that going for it as well. And uh, I thought we could just touch on a few, a few of the companies that... Um, that's some, yeah, some of the most interesting elements of, of innovation are happening at. Um, you touched on Reliance earlier. I thought we could start there because it's a, a behemoth that seems to be in almost every conceivable area of the Indian economy, um, but not very well known over here. So I thought uh, as an expert in this area, you could, you could t sort of take us through what Reliance is doing and, and, and their main areas of operation that have got the most potential. So Reliance Industries is, um, you know, as mentioned, it's it's a large 50 year old conglomerate in India. And it's, it's got its, uh, you know, it's got exposure to almost all parts of the Indian economy. It started in oil and textiles. It's got a pretty massive retail operation that they own, you know, they own hotels and, and all sorts of different things. But the focus is on geo digital, which is Reliance's digital effort, and um, and uh, it's it, it. I mean, it's a very unique company, and it's a, it's a unique uh, situation. So, in addition to the geo network, which we mentioned, which really brought the country into you know four G connectivity, and and I think by the end of this year they'll have the whole country in five G. Um, and so just as a, as a, as a foundation, a point of connectivity, they're the, they're the middleman. So if you're getting on the internet there, those odds are you're doing that via geo. They also have a whole bunch of uh, other offerings. They have uh, entertainment video and music, uh, online. They have uh, financial services online, um, which they've actually spun off as a separate entity now, um, uh, they've also announced a deal with the uh, BlackRock to introduce an ETF uh, business. I, BlackRock wow. sold iShares to the local an, a local Indian mutual fund company, but they're interested in re-entering the country and they're partnering with Geo. Again, I think there's going to be a you know a massive number of Indian uh, smartphone users that are going to uh, manage their investments on their smartphone, including ETF portfolios. Yeah. Um, uh, and. And then the real question is how how is it going to shake out in e-commerce? And GeoMart has a strong position, but it's pretty competitive. You've got Flipkart in India, you've got Amazon uh, in India, and and so there's a lot 
to be seen on the e-commerce side. But one thing of note is that, um, it, you know, the U.S. tech leaders, especially uh, Facebook, Instagram, you know, Meta's platforms and uh, and Google, they have a pretty significant position in the Indian Internet uh, space. And the I think the Indian government, however, has you know, made the decision that they don't want the Silicon Valley companies to own their internet. And so they have made it, I think, clear to people in the marketplace that if you're an American technology company, your best bet is partnering with a local firm. And that's why Geo Digital really at the the very beginning of the COVID, like the Q2 of 2020, they raised one of the biggest venture rounds ever. They raised $30 billion in a venture. That would have been the biggest IPO of all time, but this was a venture raise. And the, the, the roster of investors was, you know, an elite group of global institutions that started with, uh, well, it was the uh, first investor and last investor were Google and Facebook. So again, I think you're seeing that the U.S. tech companies are, likely and other companies to to seek uh, success by partnering with Reliance um, or, or another local partner. But but for most, you know, U.S. Uh, companies, Reliance will be their first choice because of its you know dominance. Outside of Reliance, is there another company in India that you're most interested in or think has really interesting prospects? Yeah, there, there are a lot of interesting companies. Um, I think um, Zomato, the the DoorDash of India, is is interesting, um, and it's what's interesting about Zomato is that you know we call it the DoorDash of India, and yes, they deliver food, but the but the reality is that you know we have an incredibly well developed, potentially overdeveloped sort of restaurant sector, right? And we've got you know chain restaurants in almost every city across the country some of them dozens of locations. India doesn't have that. It has a very undeveloped restaurant market. And so, yes, Zomato is a food delivery, uh, you know, leader and, and you know, for the Domino's of India and other places, it, it is uh, doing most of the delivery work. But because the restaurant industry is so early, Zomato has a chance to basically help develop the entire industry and partner with the restaurants. They're, they're actually now providing the food, the actual food that the restaurants need to make the finished food. So B2B commerce that way. And and it's such a Greenfields opportunity that it, it, you know, we'll see how it plays out. But they it's an immense opportunity, again, assuming that, that the Indian consumer favors dining out or food prepared other places because it's really been in India all about you know you make making your own food and not getting food from a restaurant but I think that has a very like very strong likelihood of, of changing in Zamata's favor yeah um, another um, uh, it, you know company that we've had for a long time is info edge which in addition to serving as a a classified online marketplace, sort of a Craigslist, with a focus on on jobs. Um, it's also an investor in Zamato and in Policy Bazaar, which is the online insurance, you know, the Geico of India. So I think uh, InfoEdge is has you know been part of. It was one of the first two Indian companies we've had, so it, it's as it's older than than our fund is. So it was a day one. <laughs> holding but there's a lot of other ones coming and a lot of ones that are that are already out there we have uh, Bajaz Finance which was a you know consumer lender that has digitized their entire business it's a very profitable company the margins you know as an Omaha person you know these are index based strategies but when i look through what we own in the portfolio i i look at the kind of things i would look at if i was you know with my omaha glasses on yeah. and when I'm looking for a moat, I'm looking for high margins, especially high gross margins and operating margins. And Bajaj Finance has, you know, f- incredible margins. Um, we own an, another uh, business called the Indian Energy Exchange, which is maybe the most profitable company I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> it's, it's it. 
at the gross margin level, it's second only to Wuba, the Craigslist of China that I mentioned. Um, but uh, from a net margin basis, I don't think I've seen one as profitable as it. So it's the same kind of things that you you know that we have here. You've got online payments. Yeah. You've got you've got e-commerce. You've got gaming. You've got you know make my trip. One of our other original companies, which is the travel app. So it's again, it's the localized version of the things that that we use. Um, uh, and I guess the one other one I would I would actually go back to because I mentioned it earlier at Paytm. So Paytm, which, again, was in my presentation for, you know, five or six years before it went public as an example of the unicorns that were going to, you know, eventually IPO. And it um, it did go public right at the top of the Indian, you know, Internet market, which was about two years ago. So the stock actually is down probably 50 percent from its IPO. At one point, it was down about 80 percent, but they got the money from investors. So they've got the cash. And, and again, I featured it because of uh, uh, Berkshire's investment. And, and, and again, I, when the UPI was introduced, I was worried about the, you know, the viability of Paytm. If payments were free, how would they make any money? Well, they've become the banker to the, you know, the 13 million Corona store owners. So when you go, you know, around India, you'll see that the QR codes are everywhere now. And, and Paytm is, you know, t- accepted at almost every uh, okay. every Corona store or food stand, and um, and now they're making loans and providing uh, working capital loans to the store owners. So they're becoming a business banking uh, uh, a business. And and one of the fascinating sort of anecdotal things with Paytm, and, and by the way, they they use a, the UPI. They sit on top of the UPI, so it's a gateway for everybody. And um, most of these store owners are pretty new, all right? If you look at the chart of when the payments exploded, this was, you know, 2016, 2017. So everyone's kind of a smartphone novice. And one of the challenges they had is when people would come in and they'd say, you know, I, I made the payment and the store owner wasn't sure. He wasn't sure that the payment went through. And there were problems with people that would take screenshots of previous payments and say, oh, look, it, I already paid. <laughs> And the store owner would have to somehow, you know, sometimes call their children who are more tech savvy and say, hey, can you yeah. check? And it kind of defeated the purpose. And, you know, someone's trying to buy something quickly and they've got to stand there for five minutes while you check with your children to see if the payment happened. And so Paytm introduced a thing called the sound box, which is a plastic box with a speaker. The QR codes on it, it, it attaches to your phone via Bluetooth and it makes an audible announcement when a payment is made. So the store, storekeeper doesn't even have to be involved at all. He just, you know, keeps his ears open. And if, you know, payment process, the guy can just grab his produce and walk away without any interaction. So, so just those little anecdotal things about how this is happening on the front line are, are interesting. But, but Paytm, I think, is it a, you know, it, it, it's in a pretty good position to, to become the financial services leader for these you know, millions of small businesses. How could people get exposure to these stocks, some of these stocks or, and, and themes we've discussed today at EMQQ? Well, you know, we invest um, in all emerging markets, internet companies with EMQQ, but if you just want the India flavor, we have an India only strategy, which is INQQ and, uh, it uh, is available here in the U.S. It'll be available uh, in Europe uh, sometime uh, in the near future. But that's the best way. The INQQ, which is India, you know, it's a pure play on the India technology, the India Internet uh, sector. And I think it's uh, I think it's likely to turn out to be the best way to get the long term exposure to India, um, which, you know, the, the economic growth will be significant in India. The Indian economy will essentially double by the end of this decade, but the Indian internet economy is expected to grow about 500% wow. by the end of this decade. So I think uh, uh, this is the place where sh- investors should be and they should have a long-term outlook. Yeah. So do you think we're, we're on the sort of start of peak growth for India? Is that, is I that think he's going, going to have decades of growth. I, the you know the estimates for India's growth are in the six six and a half percent range. But 
you know, in my early China days, those numbers were 9, 10, 11%. And I am of the belief that India's economic growth could actually be faster than the current predictions. And a lot of that has to do with the value of this digital public infrastructure. I think Mm -hmm. that especially when we start talking about the introduction of a, you know, consumer credit market that's widespread, that will rely on the Autohar um, uh, and the stack. And I think at least I've seen economists who have projected that a, a, a robust consumer credit growth could add two or three full percentage points to the GDP growth. So I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if India grew at more than 6% and grew at 7 or even 8%. And in fact, the last quarter, they reported over 7%. Wow. Well, Kevin, thanks so much uh, for your insights today. It's been really uh, eye-opening. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Kevin. Take care.